So in the chat is the way that you can get your CMEs for physicians and CNEs for nurses. They are two different links. CMEs are through INOVA and CNEs are through the JOT form um, evaluation form. Um, and if you have any questions during the um, presentation, like feel free to interject. If you don't wanna say it out loud um, and unmute yourself, you can just use the chat function and Jen's gonna be uh, looking at the chat function through it. And so we're just gonna go through um, just a good review of the criteria itself, some of the gray areas, different ways to handle the gray era areas. And if there's time, um, I have some examples that we can like listen to the actual call and like decide which criteria it is. And I've learned how to use the polling function and it's super easy and super fun. So if we have time, we'll do that as well. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and start by sharing my screen. Okay, so first off, I just wanna say that trauma activation guidelines are guidelines. There's always exceptions and there's always gonna be gray areas. Not every child is the same, not every trauma is the same, and there's always those weird circumstances, which I feel is more often than not. Um, just to review for the age limits for our trauma patients at Children's National, it's under 15 years from the field or under 18 years old that are transferred from an outside hospital. That's from an ER or inpatient. And again, the injury, if the injury happened within 24 hours it, and it meets criteria, it is a trauma activation. Um, while I was preparing for this, um, I just decided to look at like our closest fiscal year. So we have all of the data from 2019. And this is just a breakdown of like what we see. So you can see that we see trauma stats more than anything, about 61%, trauma transfers 24, and trauma stat attending 15. So, and that's our highest level of act activation. And I don't think this is a, a surprise to anybody on the phone. So our criteria, we didn't just come up with it. It's not like something random that we're like, we just wanna see these kids in the trauma bay. Um, all of our criteria is based off of um, guidelines and recommendations from the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma and from the CDC field, um, field triage decision scheme. So right here, we can look at our trauma stat and trauma transfer criteria. And everything that has the little red cross by it, I guess it looks like a little red uh, square. Those are all recommendations from the American College of Surgeons. And the blue dots are um, showing you what was recommended from the CDC. And um, the biggest one, that the only one that we came up with, like basically on our own that's on this list is the struck by object, um, heavy objects falling onto head or torso. And that criteria um, isn't recommended from the ACS. However, we see severe injuries from situations like this. And our trauma stat and our trauma transfer, again, this is over 60% of our, this is like the bread and butter of a trauma service. And these are our stable kids. So when I think about our criteria, I think about trauma stats and trauma st transfers are our stable kids. And I think of our trauma stat attending kids as our possibly needing a surgeon, possibly needing a surgery. These are our unstable kids. And as you notice on here, all of, the, all of these criterias are recommended from the American College of Surgeons. And again, these are our unstable kids. So if you're gonna need the PICU, if you're gonna need a surgeon, if you're gonna need a surgical procedure, these are our trauma stat attendings. Um, and why do we care about this? So we know, um, there's literature that supports that trauma resuscitations without pre-arrival notification are associated with a decreased adherence to key components of the ATLS primary survey protocol. So that in a nutshell means we do better as a team caring for a trauma patient if we have a few minutes to prepare before they get there. So with that, we try to like decrease the number of trauma stat nows when we can. And we also know that outcomes are improved in injured patients when they get seen at a pediatric trauma center. Don't think that's a surprise to anybody on the phone, but like we just do a better job because we are a level one trauma center and we're a great team. Um, also, 
the importance of having kids in the trauma bay when they meet criteria is you have all your resources together and you don't have to wait for surgery to come down. You don't have to wait as long for CT. You don't have to wait in line with a bunch of other kids to get to x-ray. Also, you have an ease of disposition to the PICU. I did write LOL because I think that ease of disposition to any unit in the hospital can be a challenge, but this does help facilitate that transfer in a more timely manner. Cindy, can I interrupt for a second with a question? Absolutely. There was a question about um, drownings and smoke inhalation. And basically that doesn't have anything to do with surgery. So really kind of why is that a trauma activation? Why is it a trauma activation? So and you, it was drowning and? Smoke inhalation. Smoke inhalation. So both of those, um, they could have, so drownings, a lot of the times they could possibly have a cervical spine injury and that needs to be ruled out before anything because the incidence of uh, spinal injuries with drownings is pretty high. Not in and, young children, in, in teenagers for sure. But in young kids, C-spine injury is very rare with drowning. And at our center, over the last decade of the 200 or so drownings which we looked at, which we and for a multi-center site, the vast majority is too young. And you know what? Let me look at the screen. I'm pretty sure I'm going to share my screen again. To see, I'm pretty sure that the. I understand uh, smoke inhalation is associated with burns, but if it's just smoke inhalation, um, that's really a medical condition, not a trauma condition. Um, you know what? I, I, I hear what you're saying, and I, I do agree with it. However, it is recommended through the American College of Surgeons, and I'm pretty sure that is um, exactly why we have that on our criteria. Jen, do you have anything to say with that? Yeah, actually, there's, a, there's actually a list of different injuries, quote unquote, that meet the trauma definition, you know, that trauma definition of you woke up fine and then energy hits your body in some way, shape or form, making you not so fine, that are medically managed. And it's one of the reasons trauma centers across the United States have trouble comparing our numbers is because different trauma centers have chosen, have picked some of these things to put in their trauma activations and some haven't. Example, smoke inhalation, drowning. We all can agree that they're medically managed, but they technically meet the trauma definition. Um, and let's be real, I'd much rather have a medical physician treating my child who is a near drown than a surgeon. Um, why we've chosen to keep those in here, I don't really have the history to that. Um, it's not that it's something that couldn't be looked at, but um, I think what we've opted to do with the near drowned is call a near drowned medical unless anybody is concerned about a head injury or a cervical spine injury, which I know are um, uncommon. You know, some of the ones that we've not chosen are, you know, stings and snake bites and um, uh, heat exhaustion that some other places have put in there, but there really is a, a list of medically treated quote-unquote injury. So I don't know if that helps or not. It, it's not perfect. It, it's, it's not the greatest answer I can give you, but it's the one I know. Okay. Okay, let's keep moving. Okay. Um, so our goals as the, as the Department of Trauma and Burn Surgery is that we have early recognition of injuries and potential injuries. Um, and I think that's important to remember. It's, we may not find an injury, but we are more astute at finding those potential injuries. And I think that that might be another reason of why our criteria seems wide. But in reality, when looking at our criteria versus many other pediatric hospitals criteria, ours is pretty, like we're pretty median in the road. We're not, we don't have a ton and we don't have too little. I feel like we have just about right. We also wanna be able to provide the same standard of care for each patient. And our goals in doing that is we wanna decrease our numbers of missed activations and decrease our numbers of stat nows. Now, I will say that I've been working with trauma and burn surgery for about five years 
And in the past five years, our number of decrease, I mean, our number of missed activations have gone substantially down and our numbers of um, statin L's have also substantially gone down. So we're actually doing quite well in this area, but it's always good to review. Um, and in preparation for today, I decided to look just at the data of FY 2020 to see where we're at right now. And since July 1st of 2019 until now, we've had 26 missed activations. And here you can see like which activations that we are missing the most and you know, what is it? And so the one that we're missing the most is a GCS nine to 14. And that makes sense to me because I don't feel like a lot of people wanna call a trauma if you have a GCS of 14. But when I looked at the disposition of the kids in this category, Four of them were admitted to the hospital, two were admitted to the PICU, two were admitted to surgical care, and one was discharged home. So there is, it does make sense to me of why this can be and need to be a trauma activation. So I looked at like, where do all of these kids go that are missed? Like, do they all go home? Do they, do any of them go to the OR? And what we found is like 14 out of the 26, are admitted to the hospital and that's either admitted to surgical care or the PICU and 12 are sent home. And then when I, I just looked at like how many were going to surgical care and how many were going to the PICU because when we're missing activations we want to know like did it really matter? Did it matter that they didn't have the trauma team? And I feel that if you're admitted to the hospital you are you must have an injury that needed that required an admission and this shows to me that you know these kids could have benefited from being in the hospital, I mean, being in the trauma bay. Also, when I was looking at this, I was thinking, like off the top of my head, I was wondering why we were missing these activations. And in my head, I was thinking it must be kids that are from like a personal vehicle, going through pivot, going through triage, and then, you know, they've already been in the waiting room for a while, and that's probably why they missed it. But I was completely wrong. Only six of them were transported by POV. 10 of them were transferred from an outside hospital. And that was surprising to me because I thought we have like all of the information and we have a chance to ask all of the clarifying questions and we're still missing like a good chunk of these. And I was, that was interesting to me. So I really thought it would just be the kids that were coming in from um, a private vehicle. And then when we look at our stat nows, one thing about our stat nows is there most of the stuff that's on this slide of why we have a trauma stat now, we can't control. We can't control if an ambulance gets here before they say they're going to. We can't control people just walking in the door. We can't control EMS. We do follow up whenever they don't call and it is a trauma stat now. However, we can't physically control that. Also, the patient's story can change or the status can change en route to the hospital. We can't control that either. But the part that we can is like the criteria that we hear about ahead of time that meets criteria. So the mechanism either meets criteria or the physiologic response or injury meets criteria. We can call those before and not do the eyeball thing. So if it meets criteria, we can call it prior to. Um, so now we're just gonna go through some of the gray areas of activation, unless there's any questions. Jen, do we have any? Thing before we go on to these like weird areas? Sorry, I was muted. Um, no, no questions right now. Great. So steps. I feel like steps are like the bane of any trauma center's existence, whether they are doing pediatric or adults, because everybody knows, you know, triple the height or 10 feet. But if you fall downstairs, is it really a fall? Like how tall are the steps? What are the steps made out of? Are they covered in carpet? Are they made out of concrete? Are they super steep steps? When you fell off the steps, did you fall down each step? So is it like a 10 foot fall or is it 10 one foot fall? Um, there is no strong literature out there or like a really good guideline of how to deal with the step issue. This, um, we have to just admit that this is a gray area and this is, you know, physician discretion, like you heard the story, you know what's going on, and you have the best idea of does this kid meet trauma cri um, activation criteria or not. Um, 
So steps have always been something that haunts all of us. It'd be a great research, uh, a great topic for research, but um, also a really difficult one to research. Um, also timing. So there is a lot of like a gray area of around timing. So if you have a child that fell out of a bunk bed and is now lethargic, but it's been 14 hours, are they still a trauma activation because it's been 14 hours? Is the injury within 24 hours, 12 or 48? And the answer is if the injury occurred within 24 hours and they meet criteria, then they classify as a trauma activation. One thing that we do see is sometimes kids are seen at an outside hospital, they're discharged home, and then they either go back to that hospital or they come to our hospital within a 24 hour period. If they do that and they still meet criteria, they um, still are required for a trauma activation. Or um, And then our transfer patients. So one of those, um, the question is like, what do we call them and what do they need? So our transfer patients that they're trauma transfers. However, one of the things that we have seen is if we have a unstable trauma transfer patient, we have we sometimes get confused over what to call them. And um, you know, we've heard like all of the things like med alert, trauma, pick you, trauma transfer attending. So the real terminology that we do use for an unstable transferred patient in trauma is trauma stat attending. So a good way to think of it is if you have a stable trauma transfer patient, it's a just a trauma transfer. If you have an unstable trauma transfer, then it would be a trauma stat attending. Some of the ones that we miss from outside hospitals are kids that had a traumatic event and then required CPR, kids that had an injury and were intubated, kids that required a blood transfusion, obviously after a trauma, and also our known SDH or EDH. We do miss a lot of those. I think we missed, um, we've missed four so far this year, and three out of the four went to the PICU. Um, I feel like I saw a question come in, Jen. I don't know if you're muted or if there wasn't a question, so I'm just gonna keep on going. But again, if we have a transfer patient that is a trauma, that is unstable, then it would be a trauma stat attending. And if you do have a patient that's coming from an outside facility that is unstable, this is a great time to call surgery and say, hey, we have a trauma stat attending coming in, and this gives our um, attending surgeons an adequate amount of time to make sure that they're at the bedside by the time that the patient gets here. This is like a dream world for a trauma stat attending because when they're in the field, you know, they could have an ETA of about five minutes, but if they're coming from an outside hospital, generally our attending surgeons will be able to make it to the hospital in time. So again, if you do have a unstable trauma patient coming from an outside facility, this is a great time to call surgery and let them know that the attending surgeon needs to um, start moving this way. Um, and then I, I think that it would be remiss to um, not discuss like possible vulnerabilities with our own um, trauma criteria. And I feel like one of our biggest vulnerabilities is our burn population. So any burn over 15%, and again, this is not including superficial burns. So this is partial thickness and above. And that's what we use to um, calculate our TDSA anyway. So any burn 15% or greater, our goal is to get them to the PICU in 60 minutes or less. However, our trauma criteria for our burn patients have burns at 25% or above or a trauma stat and burns 40% and above is a trauma stat attending. That leaves that very vulnerable area of burn patients with 15 to 24% because they're not, a, not technically a trauma activation, but there's still a burn that requires a PICU in 60 minutes or less. Now, the, we, like a few years ago, our, we used to have our um, trauma stat criteria of burn patients at 15%. However, we had such a problem with the overestimation of burn sizes that we were getting 
traumas called left and right because we were getting information from the field saying we had these gigantic burns. And then the kids would come in and their burns would be like 5% and they don't need the trauma bay. So this is just something to think of um, in the back of your mind that if you have a burn patient that is 15 to 24%, you wanna call it a trauma, feel free because you know, we really don't want to debride kids that have a burn 15% or greater in the ER. So just so you know, the reasoning why we upped those levels was just to decrease the amount of like overestimation of burns going to the trauma bay for no reason. But if you don't um, call them a trauma, just remember that our goal is to still get those kids to the PICU in, um, in 60 minutes or less. I'm gonna, Jen, is there, was there a question? I just, I can't see the chat when I am sharing my screen. No, we're, we're good. Keep oh, going. okay, okay. Jim is sharing several articles that I will pull up and get to everybody. Okay. Okay. Okay, and then I wanted to go through a couple different myths. Um, so I've heard it said more than once that trauma activations are a waste of resources and take forever. Now, I agree they can take forever because everybody kind of wants to like hang out in that room and sometimes it's really hard to get them out of the room. But the way around that is if you end up in the trauma bay and you realize quickly that this kid does not need to be a trauma, you can downgrade. Just downgrade before you know, before you get to that secondary survey. Because once we get to the secondary survey, it's kind of too late once like we already have the surgical team uh, committed. Um, another common myth is if a patient meets trauma criteria that was evaluated by an outside hospital, they don't need to be activated. So we in trauma disagree with this as well because most of our outside facilities are not trauma hospitals and none of our outside facilities are pediatric trauma um, facilities. And we believe that an evaluation in our trauma bay by our team is the best thing for that patient. And we want to do the same thing for every patient the same way every time if we can. Another myth is um, if a patient's intubated at an outside hospital, they should be directly admitted to the PICU. Also, if um, all the same things apply in this situation, um, they still need an evaluation by our team. Um, and a note about downgrading. So downgrading occurs at the door or as soon as you possibly can. Um, things that we've seen a lot is sometimes EMS does not, um, you can't get the full story from them. And we completely understand that. Um, if, you, if all you get is you have a category one alpha coming from an MVC and no further details, like the question is, you know, should I call it a trauma? Should I call it should I call it at all? Should I call it a trauma stat or should I call it a trauma stat attending? We don't want you to like worry about calling a trauma stat attending and then not needing them. You can always call a trauma att stat attending and if the kid rolls in and they're talking to you having a lollipop, you can always downgrade. Um, and things to think about downgrading, if you've already called a, a trauma stat attending, is the kid stable or unstable? If they're stable, you can downgrade. Um, do they need to pick you? I'd keep it at a trauma stat attending. If they need a surgical procedure, absolutely. Um, but I feel like we could downgrade a lot more than we, than we do, and it's completely reasonable to downgrade. Also, we can upgrade. Um, oftentimes, we do like great work in the code room, but we forget to uh, get the rest of the team involved that needs to be involved. So things to keep in the back of your mind to upgrade are like, are you about to intubate? Are you about to give blood? Do you need a surgeon? Are you gonna do a surgical procedure? Like, do you need an OR? Things to think about for upgrading. And then the process for upgrading is make sure the NAL knows. So the NAL will call ECIC and get that process started. But if the only person that knows that you need to upgrade is like the, the unit clerk and they just do the page overhead, the page overhead only happens in the ER, but you have to call ECIC to get the page overhead through the whole hospital. Um, and we want to make sure that the right people come. We want to make sure that the PICU comes. We want to make sure that the attending surgeon comes. Cindy, I have a question. Um, yep. Basically, when we downgrade a trauma activation, is this reported to the American College of Surgeons and counted towards the 10% missed activations that they reviewed for the trauma accreditation? I went ahead and answered this just in the chat. 
uh, and basically said no. Um, actually, downgrading, upgrading and downgrading is actually looked upon favorably because you've taken the data that you've gotten um, since, since you've started assessing that child and uh, put it towards use of, use of resources. The American College is actually more tuned into over triage and under triage. So if we've identified that we've under triaged and we correct that with upgrading or we've identified we've over triaged and correct it with downgrading, it actually looks upon it, uh, the ACS looks upon that more favorably when we show them our data. Um, okay, so I, I feel like I see a question about like what happens if, like what happens when we downgrade? Yes. Um, so just when kidding. we downgrade, I mean, that's just saying that you, you would uh, like, I, I would leave the code room, go into a regular room, and I guess you already have your trauma console there if you need them. But I feel like if you downgrade, you just get rid of all the resources that you had and I guess you already have trauma at the bedside, so you get them to do their consult and move along. Um, Jen? No, I agree. I mean, I think if we have a trauma stat coming in or a trauma transfer and it's a decision to downgrade, um, obviously, you know, we don't need four nurses in the room. We don't need uh, three physicians, you know, four physicians when you county anesthesia and uh, people can be excused back to uh, where they came from in their assignments. And this becomes just an ED patient. Um, you know, if it remains in the code room, that's just a location, not a status. Um, I think if you downgrade from a trauma stat attending to just a trauma stat, um, it basically pick you can be pick you as excused or doesn't need to come as well as the attending surgeon. We can just run it with a surgical coordinator. I know that all sounds very easy and uh, totally makes sense in discussion, but is much harder to put in place in practice. I seem to see that when we downgrade, everybody is pretty invested and nobody really wants to leave the room. So how to actually make that happen in the real world, um, I think we're all open to suggestions on that. Hmm. Okay, um, moving on to just a couple notes about penetrating trauma. So any penetrating trauma to the t-shirt and boxers area does count as a trauma stat attending. Other things to think about for um, gunshot wounds is if you're showing like early signs and symptoms of shock or significant active bleeding. Um, the reason why we're bringing this up today is that in uh, fiscal year 2019, we had a couple very small puncture wounds to the, um, the t-shirt area. So like in the front of the chest or in the back that were very small wounds by very small knives. However, um, a few of those kids needed um, chest tubes and um, and they were missed as activations. They were not um, listed in our FY 2020 um, missed activations. Again, this was from 2019, but it is something to um, think about and remember that if you do have penetrating trauma, so stabbings, gunshot wounds, to the t-shirt and boxers area, that does classify um, as a trauma stat attending. Um, Cindy, also, I think it's important to mention on the flip side of that, we do get a good number of children who come in with uh, bullet grazes, uh, superficial stabbing, superficial abrasions, I guess, um, that were called in as stabbings that these kids do end up being, quote unquote, nothing, um, very stable, not very injured. Um, and and there's, there's no good way to, ha no good way to to differentiate that until we actually see the patient. Hence the reason we just say, go ahead and call them as a, pen, uh, as a trauma and we can downgrade. Um, most of our over triage that we see that we do report to the American College is penetrating injury. And we're not alone with that. Um, pediatric hospitals across the country struggle with this same problem. Okay, and then um, this is our last like gray area and this really, this isn't a gray area. It's just an interesting conversation that goes along with activation. So when we have kids that are missing fingers and toes, a lot of people want to know like, why don't we just send these kids directly to Hopkins Inn or Union Memorial? And then if you do have to transfer out, like who makes the call? 
So most digits aren't eligible for, for replantation. Um, in the past, like in the past year, I think we actually had two that were, um, but that is not, that's the exception, not the rule. And the person that makes that call, that would be orthopedics. So whoever is the hand surgeon on call, if it's a hand, obviously not like a foot, but the um, hand surgeon on call will communicate directly with the receiving physician. And um, that is just the way that we have that set up. And in our trauma and burn manual, this is a copy of the page of our uh, replantation uh, like algorithm of how things go. And um, so that is the, that's the crux of just the review of the um, activation criteria. Um, if we, if you want to interact or talk and ask questions like audibly, we can do that um, now, or we, because um, yeah, we still have another 30 minutes. And I also have uh, six interesting examples and we can use the poll everywhere. So um, I'll just wait for just like a minute and let's, and if somebody Cindy, wants I, have a, yes. I have a question about trauma transfers. Yeah. So I just want to reiterate with this group and get your buy-in and Jennifer's buy-in that the the idea of a trauma transfer is that these kids are basically direct admissions, but they're stopping in the ED so we can do a focused assessment and make sure that everything that's needed prior to admission has been done. Isn't that right? That, that sounds correct to me, to make sure that the, um, the scans have come in, the second read orders have been put in, all of like the head to toe assessment, like the ATLS assessment has been done by our trauma team yep. to make sure that we haven't missed any potential injuries before they are admitted. Right, so it's appropriate in these cases to put in the bed request before the patient arrives and then expedite their care in the ED and then get them upstairs, correct? I think absolutely. Um, yeah. One of the other reasons when we kind of put this several years ago, when we kind of changed things to make all trauma transfers stop in the ED, one of the other things we found is that the outside hospital would request a, an ICU bed and they would come in and really not meet the same, obviously our criteria for ICU bed is sometimes different than our outside transferring hospitals. And so not only to make sure that we're hitting everything um, but to make sure that their disposition is truly where they need to go. Yeah. Oh, that's an important point. This is Mike. There are a significant percentage of our trauma transfers who do not get admitted. Yeah. And putting in a bed order ahead of time was problematic. And when we've talked about this with Randy before, we decided that we weren't going to do that anymore because so many kids either didn't get admitted or their disposition location was indeterminate at the time of the trauma transfer. Pick you, floor, whatever. Sure, Mike, there are, there, there, there are the indeterminate ones, but there's ones that clearly need to be admitted. Uh, you know, femur fractures, intracranial bleeds, et cetera. And so I think we could put in for those. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you know how inefficient our admissions process is. It can take three hours, so you may as well get the ball rolling. Sounds good. Then you have to put in the caveat that when you do that and the patient comes through the ED, what you'll need to do is switch out from direct admit to admit from ED when the time comes. Admissions office will insist upon that. You'll have to do the order again. because I had to do it two nights ago <laughs> for the exact same circumstance, so. Yeah, and, and Jim, I'd agree with Mike that I just put in the chat, but I'm not sure if people are watching that, that in the end, it turns out to be a small number of the patients that we are explicitly clear on where they're gonna go, because even the head injuries may, may or may not need the PICU depending on the size of the bleed or presence of a bleed. Um, the femur fractures may or may not unlikely need pick you, but it's just not clear in too many of the patients that I think it's really a small minority that it's so explicit that we could just wait till they arrive. And I understand the delay in process, but to 
to create an algorithm to say that these patients can be directly admitted, I think will narrow down to so few that it's not an effective use of algorithm making. Okay, well, um, I think um, we have time to go through a couple of the examples. And um, I'm really excited to try out this poll, um, the poll option on Zoom. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so our first example, I'm gonna play the call for you. You need your mouth sticking. One second, I'm just gonna fast forward it to the part where Okay. Neural male coming by AMR mm -hmm. uh, was in the MVC uh, going only about 25 miles an hour, no LOC, no airbag deployment. Uh, they were going straight in the vehicle turn to make a right turn in front of them. Okay. Patient was asleep at the time, so it really doesn't remember what happened. Uh, his complaint of head pain. Not okay. backboarded or collared, and they'll be here in 10 minutes. Okay, so we have a 10 year old male was involved in an MVC going 25 miles an hour, no LOC, no airbag deployment, patient was asleep, doesn't remember what happened, chief complaint is head pain, not backboarded and collared. And I'm going to open up the poll. Okay, so the poll is open if you could just uh, vote on whether it's a trauma stat, a trauma transfer, trauma stat attending, or no activation. And I'll leave the poll open for 20 seconds total. Okay. So I'm going to share, uh, share the results with you guys. And um, so you can see that 50% 50 50 of people said it was a trauma stat and 50% of everybody says there was no activation. So in reality, this type of call is physician discretion because we don't have all the info. So the two big questions and that we always need to get answered for like our MVCs is how fast was the car going and were they restrained or not? And we don't know if this child was restrained or not. So this is physician discretion and we do need more information. I will say that um, in the last year, ECIC, um, Liz Berg has been working um, a lot with ECIC to ask them to ask those two questions in calls like this. Because often if EMS calls and then they give the information to ECIC and then ECIC calls the MCO and the charge nurse, you don't have that interaction with EMS a lot of the times. So if you, if you get that front loaded information because ECIC is asking the question, it does help with making this um, answer. So everybody was right. Um, for example two, let me go ahead and get that pulled up. I'm Dr. Sherman. Second, I'm just gonna fast forward it to where the good stuff is. All right. A 14-month-old who came in to our ER um, with um, a coffee pot fell on his head and he's got um, partial thickness burns on his um, arm and his chest uh -huh. on his um, left side and then a part of his ear looks like it's scalded okay. and then um, and then his head as well okay okay um, and um, we did some debridement. Mm -hmm. We um, did sylvadine, bacitacin, put him on um, some IV fluids. Okay. Uh, and uh, yeah. what, do you, uh, what do you estimate the uh, surface area of the burn was? What is it? It's um, um, the surface area of the burns um, is about like 26%. Um, okay. Okay, so this is a child that's from an outside facility, 14 month old, coffee pot fell on his head, partial thickness burns to arm, chest, left side, ear, and head. They did debridement, they put on sylvadine, bacitracin, started fluids, and it's 26%. I'm gonna open up the poll. Okay, 
Okay, and just please vote on whatever you think this is. Trauma stat, trauma transfer, trauma stat attending, or no activation. Okay, I'm going to close the poll and share the results. So our highest um, number of people said that this is a trauma transfer. And that is correct. So any burn 25% and greater is a trauma transfer. And again, it was from an outside facility. If this was from the field, it would be a trauma stat. It's from an outside facility, so it's a trauma transfer. Um, and again, a trauma stat attending for burns would be 40%. Any questions before I go on to example number three? This is Devesh. I was the lone person who said no activation because I don't believe the 26% based upon the description. <laughs> I completely understand what you're saying with that. And um, it's exactly because of stuff like that that we made our activation that much higher. So it might capture like anything 15% and greater. But I think the thing you have to keep in mind, this is Pavan, is that this is a physician giving an estimate, which can still be off, but likely maybe more accurate than a EMS provider in the field in a very short time having to make that assessment. And so that's why I would probably give credence to that 26%. Maybe it's more like 20, but still may even be enough to go to the PICU from the original criteria of 15%. 26% is a quarter of the entire body surface area what was described in that call did not appear anywhere near to be a quarter of its entire body surface area. You know, and this is, this is Jen, this is where I think this gets really difficult is, you know, um, I think for burns, everybody innate, innately goes and overestimates. If I eyeball a burn, I always overestimate. Um, with as long as I've been doing it. Um, and so, you know, some of these are going to be right when we activate, we're going to be wrong when we activate. And, you know, it kind of comes down to doing the best you can based on the report you're getting, the picture you've built in your mind and looking at our guidelines and we just kind of go from there. This is, this is Mike and the one thing that just hasn't come up about trauma transfers in general, but the crucial step that you should take is for all trauma transfers, once you have this information, call the senior surgeon and say, here's a patient who's coming. This is what we know. Here's what I propose we do and then discuss it and come up with a plan because that way, even if there's still, you know, you still don't know exactly what the right answer is. At least everybody's on the same page and from the beginning you can make it more efficient. This, this kid's burns are covered in bacitrace and you're not going to know how big these burns are for hours. You're going to need to sedate the kid just to get the, I'm sorry, the sylvadine off to figure out how much the burn surface area is. This, this patient's a mess. So, yeah. but in general, trauma transfer, talk to the surgeon before they come. That's a really good point. Thank you for bringing that up. Okay, um, for example three, I'm gonna. Yeah, I'm gonna... Hold on one second, get this to. So he was an eight-year-old male involved in a moped accident with a uh, car. Patient short car on the right side, causing a dent. Uh, he has a uh, road rash through both knees, both elbows, and uh, uh, braces to the abdominal, abdomen, and to the right temple of the head. He was not wearing a helmet at the time. There was no LSD. Vitals are 140 over 78, falls on 129, 98% No, Again, no LSD, no neck or back. They have approximately 15 minute EPA.
Okay, so eight year old male, um, he was on a moped that struck a car, caused a dent in the car, road rash to knees, elbows, abrasions to abdomen and right temple of head, not wearing a helmet, no LOC, no neck or back pain. So I'm gonna open up the poll. And the poll is open. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll because everybody's saying the same thing. So everybody has said that this kid is um, a trauma stat. And um, so when we look at this, this would be um, a physician discretion because technically um, when you look at our criteria word for word, we don't have anything that talks about mopeds. We don't have anything talking about like kids on mopeds running into cars. We don't know how fast the moped was going um but um everybody agrees that it was a trauma stat and um like i i agree with I, I agree with that as well um it's just an interesting um an interesting injury and an interesting mechanism because it doesn't technically meet like that picture perfect trauma activation criteria um let's see and the beauty of physician discretion yeah absolutely Okay, I'm going to do, let's see what time it is. Okay, I'm going to do one more. We have Dr. Moore. Vehicle. NBC estimated speed was approximately 50. With a three year old male patient, an obvious fit to fracture. He does have two hematomas, uh, one of the frontal lobe and one um, to the side of his head. Mom said that immediately after the accident, he was sleepy. Um, he's also complaining of abdominal pain. There is significant um, intrusion into his compartment of the vehicle. Um, it was a rear end impact. Current voters of VP 116 over 83, pulse rate 160. He's trying to snap on the monitor. He's 97% on room air. We have the extremity splendid, people's even reactive. We're just requesting recommendation if you want him there or he could go to Meredith. No, bring him. Okay, so um, I think this is also a really good example of sometimes it's really hard to hear all of the information. So you're trying to pick out um, key words. So this is um, a three vehicle MVC. Estimated speed was 50. Um, this was a three year old male, obvious tid fib fracture, two hematomas, sleepy after accident, complaining of abdominal pain with significant intrusion. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open up the poll. Okay, I'm going to close the poll and then share the results. So um, there's no question that this kid is a trauma, um, but we have like some people saying a trauma stat and some people saying like trauma stat attending. So again, this everything is like defaults to physician discretion, but this child does meet, meet the criteria for a trauma stat. But if you are concerned with like the word significant intrusion and he has an obvious tib fib fracture in that EMS may not be seeing the whole story that calling a trauma stat attending is completely appropriate if you feel that um, things are a lot worse than um, what you're hearing. I think we have time for one more unless anybody wanted to discuss that one any further. One second, let me just get this to where it needs to be. That. Okay, so I have a trauma coming in. It's a one and a half year old who was walking with mom and um, was they were struck by a vehicle going about 20 to 25 miles per hour. They both went under the vehicle. Um, bystanders say that the patient uh, was unconscious initially. Now 
he's alert and acting age appropriate, but um, has abrasions to the head and arms, but no obvious signs of injuries, and they do have him immobilized. Okay, so we have a one and a half year old walking with mom. Uh, they were both hit by a vehicle that was going 20 to 25 miles an hour. Both patients went under the vehicle. Um, the child was unconscious, but now is alert and acting age appropriate with abrasions to his head and arm and is immobilized. I'm going to go ahead and open the poll. All right. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close it and share the results. So most of um, most of us are saying that this kid is a trauma stat. Um, again, this isn't a question whether this is a trauma. It's like, is it a trauma stat? Is it a trauma stat attending? And strictly um, per our criteria, here, um, this child would be a trauma stat. However, if you want to call a trauma stat attending and then downgrade if needed or continue to keep it a trauma stat once the child got there, Again, that is completely up to you. Um, and I, I, want, I want to be respectful of everybody's time and we only have five minutes to go and I don't want to open up like another can of worms before the ending of this. Um, so I'll just like open the floor for any questions and thank you guys very much for um, engaging and like participating in this. And that's it. And if uh, everybody can see the CME and CNE information in the chat, am I correct? Um, no, I didn't see it. Can you guys, anybody else see it in there? There, I just sent um, everything again. Let's see. That, I, I'm hoping that came through. The CME link is first and then the directions to get your CMEs is there. there. And when you're looking for it on the CMEs, just look under the heading of grand rounds. So it'll say something like grand rounds and activation criteria. Thank you, Caleb. Again, thank you for everybody for joining. Um, not always a cut and dry uh, lecture as this is always a gray zone. So um, always, always uh, happy to answer questions or to uh, review anything. And for those of you who get emails from me saying, please help me understand. Um, it's usually because I realize that there's a whole lot more to the story than what I can glean from video or charts. And a lot of times when I hear really kind of all the things that went around your decision making, things can make sense. And we can always um, really explain kind of uh, where everybody's head was in the game. So thank you and have a great day. Yeah, and, um, and through our, and just to um, tag along with what Jen said, um, every time that like we don't follow like our own criteria, like we review every single trauma patient, whether they went into the trauma bay or not. So it's just like a record of like, how, like, do we need to change this? Can we change it? A lot of the, um, the criteria we can't change because they are ACS recommendations. So we follow their guidelines um, and we choose to follow their guidelines because they keep us designated as a trauma center. So kind of works out. But I think that that's why a lot of the times if like you do get an email from trauma. It's like, hey, we just want to know like what worked, what didn't, and um, basically exactly what Jen said. But thank you so much. And um, I hope you guys have a great day. And uh, yeah, enjoy. Stay safe. Thanks.